Christina Perla studied industrial design at the Pratt Institute in New York. After graduating, she worked for several companies in design and product development before deciding to go freelance. Around the same time, she and her partner, Manny Mota, started their own design and development firm, Tangent Design, of which she is co-founder and creative director. They acquired 3D Uniprint, a 3D printing company with whom they'd been working closely. And within a few months, they had renamed 3D Uniprint to MakeLab, where Christina is currently co-founder and CEO. MakeLab strives to simplify the process of realizing creative ideas. At last count, MakeLab has completed over 200,000 prints on over 10,000 projects for 6,000 clients, including Silver Cup Studios, OMA, Acom, Yahoo, and collaborations with Jaden Smith, NVIDIA, and many more. Christina is also an NYC ambassador and, as of earlier this year, a board director for Women in 3D Printing, an industry network that spans 23 countries with 65 chapters and over 10,000 community members. For all of this, for her tireless passion for elevating women in 3D printing and technology, for her love of creativity and innovative design, she is one of our dream collaborators. Thank you so much for chatting with us, Christina Perla. Thank you. Wow, that was an incredible introduction, first of all. Like, that that was <laughs> well, incredible. Lady. It's nonfiction, I should say. It's just so strange, like, hearing it from someone else. You know what I mean? Like, it's one of those imposter syndrome moments where you're just like, oh, wow. Like, to have someone else sum it up, you're just like, oh, wow, I really did do all that. I guess I guess it is a lot, <laughs> you know? You're a director of women in 3D printing, which is similar to Freebird in terms of it being a network of women focusing on a particular sector, coming together to encourage newcomers and to increase the visibility of women in your field. And we really admire this initiative. So tell us more about it. Yeah, so women in 3D printing, the main mission is to inspire, promote and support women who are in or using additive manufacturing, aka 3D printing. And so basically there's a few ways that the organization does this. Pre-COVID, we had uh, local chapters. We still do have local chapters, but each local chapter had a monthly happy hour. And that's basically my role as NYC ambassador. My role was to gather um, people to create like a space for us to connect, network, and learn about each other and possibly inspire more people to, more women to come into the industry. Um, right now, the stats are, as you said, we're about 13, 12, like 10 to 13 percent. It's really difficult to find numbers on this, but we only make up like 10 to 13 percent of the industry. Our goal is 50-50, whether that's founders um, who are using 3D printing who or who are leveraging 3D printing in some way or um, in the boardroom or in high level positions at corporations. I kind of took it a step further and I created an event series called A Conversation With where I would have one special guest and I'd have a 30 to 45 minute long uh, live interview fireside chat style um, conversation with them on stage and there would be an audience we had sponsors we had spo sponsors had the option of like having a table um, to kind of promote the networking portion after the whole speaking event and then I'd also have uh, four lightning speakers who gave like quick uh, five minute long, five to 10 minute long presentations on, on the topic of the evening. So the first topic was um, just about being like a trailblazer. The second topic was about community. The third one was supposed to be about business. I had everything lined up, space was procured, everything. And then that was, that was supposed to be in May. <laughs> oh, man. I was looking at the one about community and I was like, that's such a perfect topic yeah. for you guys because that's literally what you what you're building yeah. and what you're generating yeah it was it's like it's been such a key proponent of like my personal journey and like in college um everyone would tell me you know everyone kind of tries to give you career advice and everyone's like community is everything networking is everything like talk to people ask questions like you know the standard uh post-college grad talk and I didn't really believe it because it seemed corny to me. But like as I'm looking back and reflecting on my own career, I wouldn't have gotten this far without community. I remember going through university and all my lectures would be like, you've got to learn how to give a presentation. You've got to learn how to network. And they were right. As you said, like, I wish I had spent that time really yeah 
finessing that networking skill. It is so important. And it's also, if you think about it, like when most people go to college, um, what we're like 19 years old and we graduate when we're 22, you're still very much in your shell at that point, development wise. And it's, I found it very difficult. I, I mean, I might not have appeared this way, but like, this is definitely how I felt. I just felt like it was, I'm able to own my story now. And I couldn't have done that before. I came off as very shy. I was so unsure. I didn't know where I stood. I, I just always looked at like, um, Pratt was a very competitive environment. So I would always like kind of compare myself to my uh, peers. And so I just carried that like all on me into almost every conversation I had. So I always felt like the newbie. So I ended up, that's, that's what I ended up playing up during these like networking events I would just be like give me advice like I could use anything I'm a sponge like let me learn which was good but like it's so different than how I would approach now I still want to learn but I definitely have a lot more confidence (laughs) we want to push women to the forefront of the arts and creative businesses um basically making us public in an environment that we've witnessed to be macho um, or dominated by men and and your group does exactly the same thing so expanding on why this group is important to you Christina and to feminism and to women in this sector I always believe that diversity is key and this really plays into my design background because as an industrial designer your job is to, is to kind of bridge two things together and find commonalities and find that common thread and figure out a way to bridge them together to make something beautiful Like that's one of the approaches that you take in terms of design thinking. I like to apply that to business because, you know, from what from what I know in my experience so far and what I've seen, um, not only in this industry, but also other industries, you you don't want to be in your bubble as a business leader. The more you're in your bubble, you're going to hit a wall very quickly and you're not you're going to stunt your own growth. So I always find that diverse and different ways of thinking should be welcome into a business leader's like frame of mind and their every day. You should always be exploring. It's not always easy to because time, time permitting, (laughs) but um, that's why it's really important to build that into your team, right? Into key roles in your organization. 3D printing is known for not being like super, super diverse. And also the numbers on, on like female involvement is like very, very low. I think that this whole entire industry can grow a lot more if we're a lot more inclusive. I think it's better for everyone. It's so important to role model too because it starts with the kids. A lot of careers um, start out with exploration and if women in 3D printing can be one of the forefronts of those, of, of someone's exploration, you never know where it's going to go. And role modeling, role modeling is just like so important. I actually didn't Uh, know about women 3D printing until further along in my career, but I did look up to other organizations that kind of helped guide my way. I attended Creative Mornings, which is founded by Tina Roth Eisenberg. I went to um, as many business boot camps that I could that were run by Christine Souffrant and Tim. She's like a Forbes 30 out of 30. She's like a boss on her on her website for a while back in the day. Like a few years ago, she would just have a list of resources that were accessible for you starting your business. And I just appreciated the, the wealth of knowledge that she was, she was really wanting to give. They really helped me find my confidence and then also get started. And I, so when I saw an opportunity with women in 3D printing to be able to do that for someone else, it was kind of like a no brainer. It just, it's just so much a part of like my story that I just wanna pay it forward. So it's just like a part of who I am, you know? Again, going back to the different perspectives, like who knows where we can take this industry if we do have different minds coming in? Like if, if the industry hasn't been known as a creative industry up until more recently, maybe it's time to change that. How do we change that? Let's go back to the drawing board. Like let's get some different minds in here to push it forward, some more leadership, you know? Tell us about your process of starting. Oh my gosh. It's like, it's like truly one of those crazy stories. Like, uh, yeah, it was, it's crazy. I, so we became 3D Uniprints, one of their top customers because we were just prototyping so often. And 
Manny and I are very, my partner Manny and I were like very hands-on people. So when we were doing um, Tangent and we were taking on client projects, um, we always wanted to, at every, at every iteration, we wanted to touch and feel it. We wanted to do a fit test. We needed to have that, um, we need to ensure that it would work before we present it to the client, before we can make other decisions. Like that's just like how we work in our process and design and, and product development. So I would constantly make trips over to 3D Uniprint to pick up my prints because I couldn't even wait for it to ship. So I'd just like go drive over there and like pick them up. And so I made a countless number of uh, trips over there. And we, in 2016, became um, one of their top clients, which was insane. And I remember, I don't know if it was the first time we met or the second time we met. I met both Rico, the previous owner, and his wife, who were running the company. Um, We just started talking because we had natural interests. And at that time, like, I was very much a sponge. I was just like, oh, I'm interested in this. I was just exploring the whole idea of business and, like, Things were just, I was making connections that I hadn't before, so I wanted to talk about them. I wanted to speculate on other businesses, on the tech giants. I, like, wanted to talk about all of this stuff. And he had that same interest. So we actually went, him and I went out, went out to coffee, and we ended up talking for, like, two hours. And it was totally unproductive. Like, we were just, like, spitting, spitting the shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know what that's a saying, but, like, we were, we were just, like, talking, um, and just speculating on stuff, talking strategy, hopes and dreams, like nothing super executable and actionable. Um, and then, so every time we would uh, go to pick up, sometimes Manny and I would go to pick up, sometimes I, w- I would just go by myself. Like we'd have a short little conversation. I'd ask him how business was doing. And we just became like friends. And I was genuinely interested because he was such a kind person. And he was so on it with the customer service. Like he would, He would not forget about me. He would not forget about my prints. He'd like go the extra mile. And I really liked that because um, I hadn't really messed with 3D printing before that. My partner had did did buy a few machines, but like I never touched them. I just sent things to him to print. I was like, you do it. (laughs) So Rico really Rico really just taking the extra time to like guide me through the process really taught me about 3d printing and then made me more knowledgeable so the next time i came to him i had less questions and i was more of a pro user i remember i think it was in maybe september and october i went to pick up and he was stressed out he had a visa or he was applying for a visa um and he moved to china because he didn't he didn't get it so him and his family actually moved back to china but they had two kids they have two kids and they had family in china so it wasn't they're very flexible people, so they weren't entirely too bummed out. Like they're just like, okay, this is what life threw at us. Let's start. Let's start a business in China. Like it's okay. And he also was talking about his contingency plan. He's like, I might just have to like sell the machines or something. And so I was like, oh wow, that's like, that's a lot. I didn't think anything of it. I brought that information back home. Manny and I were talking about, it and he's like, babe. He's like, he's like, babe what if we take over their business one day? And I was like, oh, but like, you know, like that's just like later. Who knows what's going to happen? They're probably going to make it. Like, you know, they're going to get the visa. They'll, they'll, everything's going to be okay. It's like not in our plan for like life, you know, whatever. I like brush it off. Then in January, like early January, I got a text on a Sunday night and, and uh, from Rico and he was like, I want to talk to you about acquiring the company. I didn't even think. It was just pure reaction. I was just like, immediately excited and so I ran and I found Manny somewhere I forgot what he was doing I he wasn't with me at the time and I got the text so I, I was in my PJs I I think he was like outside somewhere I just like went and found him um and I he might have been talking to someone I just interrupted and I was like babe we have to do this and then he was the one that was a little bit more hesitant at first but then you know a few minutes later um he was like totally on board it was just the shock of it all and then the next day we had a meeting and then three months later we had signed the papers and we were the official like new owners of 3D Uniprint. And it was like that crazy. <laughs> we were working out of home at that point doing our product design and development. So we were like, we need to hire someone. Like we can't have all these machines here. Uh, what do we do? So we were just looking on, you know, Brooklyn real estate and found a place, signed the lease and then <laughs> We ended up really liking the location and the building. Um, And yeah, it was just like one thing after the other. It was like a good omens, you know, and good things that necessarily we didn't 
have the intent for, but I think that we just got, it was both luck and both, I think just a lot of good gut decisions that culminated to this point, but like, I can't take credit for for all of it. (laughs) It's amazing how many people listen to their gut and know what to follow. It really is your guiding point of view, isn't it? Especially in the beginning when you really don't know much. Like, (laughs) I did not know a lot back then. Um, But my my reaction to this, my strong reaction, just told me that I needed to follow it, you know? And same with Manny, and we both agreed, and we were like, you know what, let's do this. We analyzed the risk, and, you know, from my point of view, I was like, well, you know, if if it fails, I could still get a job. Like, this isn't a total loss. Like, I'm going to learn from this experience whether it's successful or not. So um, I know I, I, I'm still hireable elsewhere if all else fails. If you can shed more light on how you felt in those early stages yeah. of your career becoming a female leader, you know, any more insight or even advice to a certain extent, Christina, for other people who might be starting out as a leader? Yeah, it was... Um... I definitely um, felt a lot of anxiety because I felt like I was faking it. I felt like it was smoke and mirrors for a really like good portion of the beginning stages. Like um, we threw a launch party um, to launch Make Lab officially from 3D Uniprint and new branding and whatnot. We did that in August, so that was like three or four months after we had just acquired everything. And it was so difficult for me to stand up in front of everyone and say, like, thank you for coming. We're so excited for this because I didn't feel it. It was such a rush that I didn't really take ownership in that process because it was so serendipitous. I was just like, well, I got lucky, you know, and that was like my stance. So a lot of the confidence factor was very much just like exercising the muscle. Um, That's how I like to think about it. It's like... um, just doing the notions until you get your sea legs and then from there it takes off. But um, I found one thing that helped a lot was just telling my story to people and being excited about it. Even though I felt insecure and unsure, I tried not to let that come to the surface too much. Um, And I tried to, like having conversations with people gauged, help me gauge my own story. It's like a point of reflection, again, like, like, like we were saying earlier. And um, another thing that I learned to do is it moves so fast. And again, it's so easy to be like, oh, that wasn't me. That was just this happened to me, you know. Um, But to really take ownership in those wins because you did do something. You did do something to get there. Even if it was serendipitous, something led you to talk to someone to and then that spirals into where you are now. And so celebrate those wins because you deserve it so that you don't get burnt out and you, you, you see progress. It's very important to recognize and validate yourself because bu- being a leader and be- being a business owner, is be- the founder's journey is like an incred- can be an incredibly lonely one and it could really like break you down. But it's really important to kind of stand up to it and find, figure out um, like what you need and when you need it and to get those things whether it's talking to people sharing with people um creating like you know a group of friends that you can text on like a friday night and be like oh i had a rough week you know and get their advice i just heard something um that someone said it was like have different different like groups of friends find some friends that are like 12 to 18 months ahead of you in their founder's journey find some that are at your level and then find some that are maybe like 12 months behind you and just having that, I think, reflects a lot on like where you were, where you're going, and where you are now. And just having that group of women or whoever it may be, male, female, you know, whatever, just having a group to talk to um, is really important. And I honestly think back, and I don't think I'm really lucky to have a partner because I don't, it, having that like baseboard just to bounce off my thoughts and to help knock out the unnecessary, like insecure thoughts and, you know, me being able to do that for him makes us both stronger. Family and friends outside of business are great, but it can be lonely and isolating this journey because they don't get it to the extent that you do. And so you can talk about it, but there's a lot of translating that needs to happen in order for them to like really understand where you are. Whereas you're, if you're talking to another founder, they've most likely experienced the exact same things that you have. You sort of occupy a space somewhere between 
yeah, between creativity and imagination and a very practical, uh, like left brain sort of space. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and and th- that's a really interesting sort of divide to to find yourself in because it's almost like being between kind of a feminine space and a mas- masculine space, yeah, you know. For sure. Um, and you've said amazing things about your uh, your desire to uh, bring more access to like to uh, diverse and immigrant communi- communities uh, into that sort of space and into yeah. both of those areas, um, as well as um, using MakeLab as a kind of uh, educational space, I suppose, in terms of making yeah. 3D printing uh more accessible and sort of doing for your clients what um, what Rico did for you guys in terms of sort of demystifying it and allowing people to better understand what can be done with it. I want to hear your thoughts on how we, on like the future Christinas and how we uh, how we make more people like you basically. So it's interesting, you touched on a point about like 3D printing and creativity, and that's not normally two things you think of together, but like, why not? If you think about Adobe, right? They're a software company, but their whole mission is to enable creatives. And what do we all use? Like, you know, I'm an industrial designer, but like every time I have to make a presentation, a graphic, social media, I prefer Adobe products. And I got introduced because not only at the time was that the status quo, but it was also like they, they seemed to really understand what I needed. And they, they enjoyed sharing that love of creativity as a company. That's like what I got. That's what I get from them. Um, and there are a ton of other companies that do the same that aren't necessarily uh, creatives themselves, but, necessar- but they're tools for creatives. And that really falls in line with like, I, I, I just put this together and I just realized like my whole thing, I, I love enabling and I love inspiring. Those are two things that I love to have an effect. If I were to choose like an effect I were to have on people, it would be those two. Um, just to like help people like be the best that they can be or achieve their goals. Like I, that, like I thrive on that. And so being able like somehow during all of this, mixing in like my conversations with Rico as a customer, um, being an industrial designer, we've managed to find this little space in 3D printing that seemed like kind of untouched because I don't think, um, I think there are some companies who are, who are really trying for the space as well, like the 3D printing and creativity, but like it's really like a passion of mine and Manny's. And I don't know if it really existed so like outright before, but we always knew that that was what we enjoyed as humans. It's just like people. And so um, also business wise, it is a way for us to monetize. I mean, the more we can expand the industry and the more we can teach someone a little bit more about what they're doing, the more connected to the why we all are. So not only does it inspire us and like the make lab culture for everyone to be connected to, you know, the end product rather than like, oh, this is like a plastic park going somewhere in the world. But more it's like, oh, what is this person using this for? And it helps guide our decision making. But then also from the user perspective, it's like the more they know, the more they come back with knowledge. So they become more of an experienced user. They become a recurring customer, which every business wants. Customer acquisition costs are pretty high. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a community move, a passion move, and then also like a good business move. Um, and it it put, it keeps us kind of like on the forefront of that conversation, which is just something that we like to have outside of Make Lab too. So it felt like very organic. Again, it was like one of those organic decisions that um, luckily like worked out. But um, for me, like being able to be that creative's right hand and like to be able to take away the techno has- technical hassles so that they can just create more. Like I, I love being that space. And so when we, when we hire, when we recruit, it's, it's a lot like, you know, do you enjoy being in that space too? Like, do you get the mission? Do you get the vision? And about like the whole 3D printing and being like such a technical industry and it being, it being very much male dominated. Again, going back to what I was saying before, like why not try something new? Why not, why not put another spin on it to attract different talent? 
um, and make it, why does it all have to be so intimidating, so technical, so, so this, this, and that? Like, there are other people that work in this industry that, um, you know, experience a different side of that. So let's talk about it. There's marketers, there's business leaders, there's, you know, there's managers, there's, there's education now. There's a big, big thing with education and 3D printing. I see a lot of companies, and they're all taking this approach as well. Like, how do we make it a little bit more friendly and open and, like, open it up a little bit, you know? By um, giving people a better understanding of the the potential for for what Make Lab can do, you're giving yeah. people the ability to like connect the dots and be like, hang on, so maybe we could start printing PPE. You know, like maybe yeah. there's this massive supply chain crisis, and actually, you guys are the puzzle piece that that can fit in there. We actually saw a bit of that with the PPE, which is really interesting. We saw a few of our clients that have ordered from us, like for prototyping needs, they just wanted to get involved. So they actually organized their own donation pools and then used us as the supplier. So if they got X amount of donations, knowing the price that we were charging for the PPE, which was like pretty much at cost, um, they would just place orders as, as they hit different, you know, markers in their donation, in their, in their fund, fundraising, sorry. Um, which was really cool. And that was like unexpected. And, you know, we didn't see, it wasn't like everyone did that. A lot of people just ordered for their own organizations, but seeing the community involvement in that aspect that come out was just so inspiring because that just hits on all of the things that we enjoy. You know what I mean? Like we're helping people, community, like gathering, organizing, enabling, like it's just, it, it was beautiful. It was like really nice to see. 3D printing and medical have always been like, um, there are a few applications, especially in dental. You see a lot of dental applications using 3D printing. So orthodontic flaps, um, Smile Direct, uh, uh, Candid, I think is another one. Like all these retainer and like uh, Invisalign braces companies are using 3D printing pretty heavily um, already. And then you do have like prosthetics and you do have like hospitals have their own 3D labs inside so that they can mock up and sort of, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to, I might mess up the words and the terminology for this, but like practice the surgery and like go through the steps and do further analysis before doing the real thing. So you see a lot of applications with that, but I'm, I, yeah, with the whole boom of, of, you know, PPE printing and whatnot, I'm kind of curious to see like what else comes out of this. I mean, yeah. it feels like you're kind of like, like you are at the point that the internet was at, like in the eighties, like there's so mm. much untapped potential. And so there's yeah. also so much potential for, um, making it into the sort of sector that, that, uh, that everyone wants it to be, you know? Yeah. It was definitely for make lab, like printing PPE was definitely like a stopgap solution for us as well. We knew that there was a decline in like regular orders because our business hinges on productivity and people shifting around, like getting used to a work from home schedule, meeting structures changing, all of that played into that. So there was a drop in our normal business, but luckily we were able to supplement with PPE. We do see PPE like kind of dying down as the months continue, but we expected that too. So it was a perfect like stopgap solution for, for us as a small business. Yeah. As well as, you know, everyone else in the yeah. world. <laughs> yeah, as well as also, like, yeah, doing something, uh, inval- doing an invaluable service for New York and, yeah. you know, other, and New Jersey, I guess. It's kind of crazy that the, the various industries that we get to work with, especially as a service bureau, it's so cool because I always love, like, learning about, like, new applications and, like, talking to customers. I'm always interested in, like, what they're printing and why and, like, where we fit in and, you know, all the data points and whatnot. But, like... It's it's pretty interesting because like now that I've been in this industry for so for like three three ish years, um, or, or a little bit more than three years, I'm just like, how would you make things otherwise if you didn't have 3D printing? Yeah, jewelry for example, uh, we print like rings that are sent directly to the caster for to be made into metal, but the only alternative to doing that before 3D printing was you take a block of wax and you hand carve it. And then from there, you perfect whatever, like, sanding uh, sanding errors or, you know, whatever in the metal phase. So there's a lot of finishing there as well. But you would be sitting there, like, carving wax 
And, and like, I didn't do this myself, but I saw classmates do this at Pratt when they were doing, when they were making metal pieces. Like, they spent hours carving a fork for a project. <laughs> like, whereas now you can just, it's, you know, it's not the most uh, it, cost effective. It is a little expensive to do that specific material. But she could have, like, done so many other things if she had used 3D printing or if it was more available back then. And so I'm just like, how would you do some of the things that we make? <laughs> They're so complex. If someone were to think about like, how would I rather pay for this in time or like, you know, a fixed cost, I think they would choose the fixed costs. And also when you consider that additive technology reduces waste, I think. Yeah. Because you're not sort of, you're not taking away from something. You're literally just using as much as you need. Depending on um, mo most, uh, the two technologies that we print in most, it's called FDM and SLA, they do require supports. But even with that, I think that there's less, there's less waste. So you're using more of just what you need. I mean, as you scale, supports are becoming more and more of an issue. Like it kind of pains me to throw away like a ton of supports. It's just plastic. I, one of our, the things that we want to do later on is figure out a way to recycle things a little bit better. Um, and maybe offer it as a different material offering at a discount just so we can reuse it. Like we're thinking about things like that because it is a growing problem, but at the scale that we're operating now, it's definitely a lot more, a lot less wasteful than alternative methods of prototyping or production. I think we should mention that, um, from the looks of your website, correct me if I'm wrong, but you do, uh, occasionally offer like international shipping. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. for our UK and non-US based um, mm. followers, MakeLab mm -hmm. is a, an available resource. Yes, absolutely. We do ship internationally. A lot of our 3D printing is such like a local business I've found too. Like it, your location really does matter. People like when you're relying on something heavily, people enjoy being close to it, even if they never visit the business. It's just that like that like, you know, in case anything happens, like I know I can just stop in or schedule something or give a call. So we don't get a ton of international clients, but we do, we do ship when we do. I have learned so much from speaking with you and I cannot wait to see more women in 3D printing. And I can't wait to see your company, Make Lab, your, your, your development and your growth, Christina, as a leader. Um, but genuinely from Freebird, from Kirsten and I, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, thank like I'm seriously honored to be here and like I'm so happy that like my experience can provide be valuable for someone else and that you guys um see that and I'm thank you. <laughs> like likewise, thank you so much. You guys are doing great. Mutual love, mutual appreciation. <laughs> Definitely. Air hug. <laughs>